Hi, thank you for joining us. Um, Jessica Kidd's very kindly agreed to do another talk on uh, limbs, angular limb deformities in foals. Um, if you are in a position to donate either to the NHS or for the Vets with Horsepower, obviously uh, the 2020 won't be able to happen. It's been postponed to next year, um, but they've got a whole heap of very deserving charities and it'd be wonderful if you could donate what you can. Thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to talk about uh, bent legs in foals um, for the next little while. So we're going to talk about angular limb deformities and flexural deformities. And I think actually it's, it's actually good to explore these two topics back to back just because they have a number of similarities, but they actually have quite a lot of points that are almost diametrically opposed. And I think it just sort of helps you get your head around what you're actually trying to deal with. So in terms of angular limb deformities versus flexural deformities, these are just a couple of points that I've put together just to try to help keep straight in our mind what we're dealing with. So flexural deformities, these are deformities that occur in the sagittal plane. So what this means is when you're examining a foal with flexural deformities, you're going to look at them from the side. That contrasts with angular limb deformities which occur in the frontal plane, which means that when you're examining these foals, you're going to be standing in front of the foal looking towards the back end. Flexural de deformities affect primarily almost exclusively soft tissue. There are a couple odd and very unusual exceptions, but generally it's a soft tissue issue whereas angular limb deformities are primarily osseous structures that are affected. Flexural deformities, we almost never need to radiograph them. Angular limb deformities, um, finances and circumstances allowing, radiography is always useful for um, coming up with a plan and also for trying to decide what the likely outlook is going to be. Flexural deformities are a condition where you just can't sit and wait. You have to deal with them immediately and you've got to come up with a plan right away. As opposed to angular limb deformities where many of these initially can be treated conservatively. And I'll discuss the coupled scenarios of the, the conditions with, that go along with angular limb deformities that we simply can't miss. And as long as you don't miss those, then if you take a little bit of a step back and wait and see what happens with angular limb deformities, that's absolutely fine. And then when we get into the slightly bewildering world of farriery for these conditions, just remember that farriery for a flexural deformity is going to be applied to the heel or the toe, whereas in angular limb deformities, it's going to be on the side of the foot. So it's either going to be medially or laterally. So let's do angular limb deformities first. And most commonly, the, the most common ones we're going to see involve the knees, the fetlocks, and the hocks. So remember that a valgus deformity as in this picture just here, means that the limb below the abnormal joint actually sits further away from the body than it should. Contrast that to a varus deformity of a fetlock here. This is a left front fetlock. And the foot should actually be sitting probably over here. So with a varus deformity, the limb below the deviation is more axial than it should be. So most commonly what we get are carpal valgus, these knock kneed falls, a, a tarsal valgus, and a fetlock varus. However, they can, get, they can get the converse in any of them. This is what's called a windswept fall. It looks like a strong breeze is going to push him over. And my thought is when you see a fall that has multiple either angular limb or particularly angular limb deformities, these are falls where actually just severely restrict their exercise and just see how they get on. Because a lot of these falls they'll either sort themselves out completely or they'll sort out a number of the issues that they have, leaving just one that you actually need to address. Because really, if, if you start trying to address multiple joints at one time, then that's problematic. Okay. Do remember that newborn foals will all show a degree of carpal valgus, which means that their toes point outward. And part of this is, is a carpal valgus. Part of it is also a rotational component, which is because when these folds are small and their chest is very narrow, their elbows sit further towards their chest wall. And as they grow and their chest expands, it pushes their elbows outwards and their toes rotate inwards. Now, when we're looking at newborn folds, there are two things which we, we simply can't miss. And if we, if we identify them, 
then that's great. The outlook is really good. If we don't identify them, then, then the likelihood of any sort of athletic function is very poor. And those two conditions are periarticular ligament laxity and incomplete ossification of the cuboidal bones. And we'll look at both of them independently. But generally, if you have if you've got a nice size mare and she produces something that's roughly the size of a rabbit, then do consider that perhaps that foal's skeleton is not completely ready to go. Okay, periarticular ligament laxity okay. um, is when it's mostly going to be the knees and the hocks, and it usually relates to the collateral ligaments, and it's just that these are not there's nothing really wrong with them. They're just not quite strong and not taut enough yet. And this this isn't a this isn't a brilliant video to show you this. Whenever you're ready. Okay, but this is a this is what you need to do. Okay, so this is a pole that has come in to have a transficeal screw put in. And what I'm doing here is I'm actually I'm just making sure that I can't Whenever move ready, this yeah. knee around. Okay, so this fold does not have periarticular ligamentous laxity. If it did, what I could do is I could just put my hand on the inside of the knee and I could push it into a, a normal position. And a good rule of thumb is if you are watching one of these holes walk towards you, and some steps it looks completely normal, and some steps it looks like it has an angular limb deformity, those are folds that almost certainly have a degree of periarticular ligamentous laxity. Okay, so we'll come back to treatment in a moment, but then let's talk about incomplete ossification of the cuboidal bones. Okay, so this is, this is the small bones of the carpus and of the hock, and this is something that you're going to see in conjunction with prematurity or dismaturity. And you can see in the picture here when they're little and you can get both on the same what we want is we actually want to have fairly uh, rectangular or square cuboidal bones. We don't, want, we don't want these rounded edges that sort of look like they're floating around in a little bit of nothing. This one is a little bit more, um, is, is even worse. These are less ossified. So remember that, that it means that these cuboidal bones have, are, they're just significantly more cartilage at this point than they should be, which is why it's not showing up radiographically. And again, remember that in foals, um, because you've got all these open growth plates, it takes a little while to get your eye in. So if we look at this one, we think, well, that looks a bit weird. There actually looks like there are four, four joints there. Remember, this is our distal radial growth plate here, and we've got a little separate center of ossification just down here. So this is a foal. This, in this image, you can see it's in a bandage. This is a foal that has an angular limb deformity in conjunction with lack of ossification. And the problem is, if here we, this is a, this is now just to, for comparison, this is a more normal, this is a slightly older foal. But if you compare what the edges of these bones look like compared to something like this. So again, this is another situation with radiography where it's always very useful to have a file on your computer of normal radiographs, because particularly for things that you don't look at very frequently, like foal limbs, it's, you'd look at these and you'd say, well, I'm not entirely sure that that's normal or that's abnormal. And then you pull up the normal in your folder and you realize that actually it's not. So this can involve the, the hops as well. And generally it's these little flat bones just down here. And one of the knock-on effects, particularly with hops, is we know that foals that have lack of ossification and that, but it goes unnoticed and they exercise on top of it and they effectively squash these bones. And then these foals, if they, have, if they become athletes or intended to be athletes, are predisposed to get parcel slab fractures. Okay, We can have even more dramatic appearances. These are some radiographs that a vet in Germany sent me. But as you can see, there's just a whole lot of nothing here. So it doesn't, this is all, this is all entirely cartilage just here. So really what we need to do is we need to protect these foals' legs until suitable ossification occurs. The ossification usually starts about two months before they're born and finishes about a month after they're born. So if you have a premature or a dismature foal, then you can the clock is set backwards, if you like, so they've come out a little bit early. There are grading scales that you can use as well if you want to, um, but probably it's more important just to look at a variety of, of images of incomplete ossification just here. And I would generally just say mild, moderate to severe, but there is indeed a uh, scale that you can use. Okay, so let's look at imaging for angular limb deformities. 
In terms of determining an angular limb deformity, do remember that a five to seven degree valgus is considered normal up until a foal is about four months of age. Now these radiographs used to be easier to obtain when we had long cassettes that we could use and it's a little bit more difficult now with the this more compact plates that we have on our radiography systems. But the basic premise is that you need to see a bit of long bone on either side of the joint in question. And if you can see where I've drawn these red lines, okay, so one red line goes down the center of the radius, one red line comes up the center of the cannon bone. You can get two bits of information out of this. One is you can measure the angle just here and your radiography software will do that for you. That's quite useful in terms of deciding what to do. The other thing that the radiographs tell you is that where the lines actually cross is the joint that is providing you the deviation. Now, in a way, that's immaterial because when we come around to talking about treatment for these, these there is only one place that we can try to manipulate the growth on these folds. But that's, that's the whole idea behind this just here. And if you look at this, if you look at this radiograph in this corner just here, you see how the bone density is really quite abnormal just here, and the growth plate is wider and irregular, and our bone quality is very, very patchy here. So this has various names, but it's usually called physeal ectasia, and it's something that you see in angular limb deformity. Sometimes you actually see discrete little free fragments of bone, and really it's just a, a question of this is distraction on this side of the growth plate just here. So if we have an angular limb deformity that's less than five degrees, we consider that mild. Five to 10 is moderate and greater than 10 is severe. And, and when we talk about, when we discuss treatment, we will divide that into folds with angular limb deformities that have normal cuboidal bones and folds with angular limb deformities that do not have normal cuboidal bones. Okay, so this is a fold that has a mild fetlock varus just here. Okay, so you see the foot sitting closer in than it is. Now, for an angular limb deformity, the, the aim of Ferrieri is to, is to encourage a more level loading of the leg and the foot, and I'll show you some diagrams to explain that further. But generally, if we're doing this in very young foals, try, if at all possible, to avoid putting any sort of extension onto these feet, because two reasons. The hoof becomes contracted very, very easily in these foals, but also every time you have to pry acrylic on and off, it's very damaging to their feet. So generally we would just start with rasping and it's a bit labor intensive because you want to do a little bit every couple of days. But if it's, if it's on a stud that you're visiting regularly, that's a little bit easier than with a private owner, but not impossible. Okay. So I find it easier to think about this in more of a pictorial sense. So one useful rule of thumb is that trimming and extensions will go on opposite sides of the foot in any one case. Okay, so if we take this hole just here, and this is the right fore and it has a fetlock varus just here, its knee doesn't look desperately straight either. This actually raises the point, tr try very, very hard not to get talked into making a call on based on a photograph that an owner sends, sends you, because this foal did indeed have a fetlock varus, but equally I could get a picture that made it look like he has one. So here's a, here's a larger version of the, of the same image. So if the foot is, if this foot is more axially than it should be, a couple things are going to happen. There's going to be more pressure on the lateral wall here, which means that's going to wear down. The medial wall is, is going to be slightly unloaded and then it's going to tend to overgrow. So we're going to end up with a, uh, an asymmetric foot. So if we're talking about trimming or rasping, if we have a valgus deformity, such as in this little guy just here, I mean, this is pretty dramatic looking at that, but again, same principles apply. On, in this case, the medial wall is the one that's going to get compressed and worn away, whereas the lateral wall is going to be the one that's overgrown. So if we have a valgus deformity, we're going to want to slightly lower the lateral wall. If we have a varus deformity as this one, bearing in mind this picture just here, we're going to slightly lower our medial wall. So again, now, if we're going to do extensions or cuffs, we're going to do this to the opposite side of the foot than the trimming, the rasping or the lowering took place on. And again, there are a couple different ways to think about it. Whoops, sorry, hold on. 
Okay, there are a couple different ways to think about it. One is that you can either just you can either just remember that it goes on the opposite side of the trimming and remember which side of the foot is taking is being overloaded. But the other way to think about it is again this is a this is a foal with now this is the left a left front fetlock. Okay, so the other way to think about it is that the extension actually goes where the foot should be sitting, if that makes sense. So the red line here should actually be sort of bisecting the foot, but you can see more of the foot is to the medial side on this fetlock varus just here. So again, if it's easier, just remember that the extension goes where the foot should properly be sitting. Okay, there's a huge variety of, uh, sorry for the sound, there's a huge variety of barrier for this, but just remember that they go on the out, the extensions go on the outer edge of the foot. There are all manner that you can do. I really like these little cuffs just here because this is a, this is fully adjustable. So it's for a variety of, of sizes of feet. And also this plastic is not so hard. This plastic is not so hard that with a hook knife, you can't, you can trim it down. So you can make a smaller extension if you want to, okay? And this is where having a relationship with a farrier, a farrier who not only does good remedial farriery, but probably equally difficult sometimes is a farrier that will discuss the case with you and you can make decisions together. Okay, so let's go back to our foals that have periarticular laxity, okay? The real problem with this, if it goes unnoticed, again, here's the little rabbit out for a walk, okay? So if you see this, this is probably not fully cooked. The problem with this is that if the leg is unstable, instead of bearing weight down the column of the leg, they're going to be bearing it at different times across different parts of the knee or the hock. And what they're going to do is then they're going to crush those cuboidal bones because they're not fully ossified. And then that is a, that is a, a bridge you can't walk back across. It's, there isn't really anything that you can do about that. So again, the recognition is the crucial thing. So if we have mild laxity, in other words, the leg's fairly stable, but you can push it a little bit and move it, generally all we're going to need to do for those is we're going to need to restrict their exercise a bit and just give them very short periods of exercise. If we have foals that are more severe, we're going to need to do some sort of support and some sort of external co-aptation. In a way, those very, very severe radiographs that I showed you where there was almost nothing in the hock and the knee, those foals are probably likely going to be recumbent anyway. And that's fine. If you've got a recumbent sick foal, you don't need to, you don't need to do anything for the knees other than occasionally re-radiograph them because if they're not up and about, then they're not going to be damaging those joints. It's the foals that are actually up and walking around where it's more of an issue. So we're gonna to need to think about some sort of external coaptation. And generally as a time frame, these improve over the course of about two weeks. We'll talk about the various, uh, I say we, the mouse in my pocket and I, we'll talk about the various uh, ways that we can do external coaptation in a moment. But so if we go back to our, so we've said the periarticular ligamentous laxity we can't miss and the incomplete ossification we can't miss either. So if we have mild ones, so in other words, they're not fully ossified, but we don't have an angular limb deformity along with it, then generally those foals just need to stay in their box. And I tend to radiograph them every two weeks until I've got an acceptable set of radiographs. However, if they're more severe, so we have a marked lack of ossification, we have ligamentous laxity and or we have an obvious angular limb deformity, then again, we're going to think about some form of external co-aptation for those foals. Okay. This is quite an old picture, but it's a lovely picture actually. This is Sidney Ricketts and when I was a vet student, I was lucky enough to see practice with him. So. Um, excellent stud vet. Okay, so let's talk about sleeve casts in foals. These are not terribly difficult to put on, but there are certainly some pitfalls in terms of doing these. Okay, so this is just a, a series of pictures. Again, in, if you were listening in last week when we were talking about um, how to restrain these foals, this reasonably is something that actually you could do in a foal that responds to the Madigan squeeze, as long as you have enough people. Failing that, I would generally give them some midazolam or some diazepam. So you don't need to anesthetize them, but they can't wriggle around when the casting material is setting or it just makes a mess. 
it's really important with sleeve casts that their foot is not incorporated because what we're doing here is we're trying to protect the cuboidal bones while the collateral ligaments tighten up a little bit. If we put an, the leg entirely in a cast, all we're going to do is we're going to perpetuate softening of all of the soft tissue structures and then we're not actually going to be any further forward. So if you see down here, there's some casting felt top and bottom. If you can't find casting felt, um, doubled up leave-ins work absolutely fine. And this is sitting just above the fetlock and this is as high as you can get below the elbow. And then if you've got stock in it, that's great. But then this is just some soft band or some ortho band just here. What you do need though, is you need someone as the nurse is doing here to hold this leg in the position that you want it to be in when the casting material is set. And sometimes you can't get a completely straight pair, but that's okay. As long as you're going in the right direction, it's fine. Okay, so this is casting felt just here. And here we're gonna get, we're getting ready to start putting some, um, some casting material over the top of it. One problem is you get to the point where you're pushing on the knee and in, on one side or the other, um, and then you've got to move your hand at some point to get the casting material on. And what you don't want to do is put any fingerprints in the casting material because that will create depressions on the far side of the cast and then will rub through the full skin. So a trick that I use is when you're ready to, to put the casting material on, I take a, a, a strip of knit firm or some other type of bandage and loop it around the leg and use that to pull in, to help straighten out the leg and hold it in position. And then that knit firm or whatever bandaging you're using can get incorporated into the cast without causing any problems, whereas you can't really put someone's hand in a cast. Okay, and here's the foal. Here's the foal now um, just about to wake up. Sorry, this uh, hopefully will turn the corner. So this as an example is actually a foal with flexural deformities, not angular limb deformities, but it's, it's a good video, I think, because it raises a couple of points, which is you can see, particularly in this leg, I have not gotten this completely straight. This was even semi-anesthetized. This was as good as I could get. But that's fine because then you can you're at least moving in the right direction and the other thing to say with these folds is that the first couple of times they often need a bit of help getting to their feet but then they learn very very quickly even with one on both front legs to get up on their own but just be careful because if they're if they're a foal with an attitude they use these like baseball bats and you can see this foal actually looks a bit like a bull up here so that's probably not helping enormously <laughs> So he can get around absolutely fine. Okay, so we've, we've ticked off the list, the two things that we really can't miss. So let's now talk about angular limb deformities of the knees specifically, where everything else is okay. They don't have lack of ossification and they don't have ligamentous laxity. The, if you identify this in, if you identify this in a very young foal, let me just move this so I can see, there we go. Generally, this is just exercise restriction. So this means a little bit of time out in a paddock with mum a couple times a day. A useful rule of thumb with full orthopedics is if you put them out for a bit of exercise and they come back in looking worse than they went out, they, then they, they're having too much exercise and you just need to back up from there. And particularly, they tend to really tire in the musculature of their forearms. And sometimes if they've really overdone it, they'll come back in and the, the, their forearms will just be quivering and fasciculating. And that says that they're actually really doing too much. Sorry, my, I don't know, okay. Okay, so again, we're just gonna keep an eye on these and make sure that things are going in the right direction. And as the foal is tolerating exercise and the angular limb deformity is improving, we can increase the amount of exercise. But, and this is a really important point, with knees, fetlocks, and hocks, which are the three most common joints affected, if there's any consideration that we're going to end up needing to take this foal to surgery, we have to be very cognizant of our windows of opportunity. And really the one that's the easiest to miss is the fetlocks, because if we're going to be doing fetlocks, uh, surgery on these fetlocks for um, transficeal growth retardation, basically, we need to do it on the fetlocks by the time they're two months of age. Hawks generally have up until four months and the carpus has the longest window of opportunity, which is up to six months. Although there are a couple of 
interesting caveats to that, which we'll which I'll mention later. So now we're talking about knees. So if there's no improvement by three months, we really should consider surgery. Okay. So periosteal stripping was very, very favorable. It's still probably done quite a lot. The whole idea here was that you were releasing the periosteum on the side of the leg that wasn't growing quickly enough. In other words, the concave side of the leg and allowing it to catch up. It's probably fair to say that actually those folds are, that appeared to respond to it were just getting better on their own. So a more useful technique is transficeal growth retardation. Screws and wires, some are still used in some cases. Staples re really sort of fell out of fashion. And by and large, what we use now almost exclusively are transficeal screws. Okay. So the whole idea here is that this is a little bit like this is a little bit like putting braces on a child so on their teeth so you're basically holding the teeth in the position and then everything else grows around them what we're trying to do here is we're trying to stop or slow the growth on the side that's going a bit too quickly and we're trying to allow the other side to catch up and if you look closely you can see this is that this Full. I've put screws and wires on one side of its knees, and it's an old photo. I have done, these are staples from a periosteal strip on the other side, just here. But this is what's going to do most of the work for you, because you're not going to be able to expand. The implants can't move, and they can't expand. So, so this side's not going to do very much, and this side hopefully will catch up. Here's an example of, of fetlocks just here. And some people really still like screws. The downside to it is that it leaves more of a cosmetic blemish, for sure. Okay. So transficeal screws are a, a, a method of doing effectively the same thing, holding one half closed. A, a consideration is that with screws and wires, we're not in any way impinging on the growth plate itself. Here, we're passing a screw right through the growth plate. So there is the possibility for uh, theoretical overcorrection even once the screw comes out, but it hasn't, um, it doesn't happen very, very often, but we do, all these implants will need to come out. This is just a nice article that was in Equine Veterinary Education the year before last from a clinic in South Africa, and just, um, that's probably a, to date, the biggest series of, of doing folds. Okay, so here's a fat lock just here, and here's uh, doing a carpus. And what you're trying to do when you do this surgery is where you want the screw to pass through the growth plate is effectively one quarter of the way in from the edge because what you're trying to do is you're trying to bisect half of the growth plate if that makes sense okay what sort of results can we get okay well this the, the, these are the um radiographs of this hole and this is at the time of implant removal and you can see one screw was there and one screw was there. So it does leave a bit of a blemish. They, they fade with time for sure. And on the knees, it's on the inside. So it's a little bit harder to see, but the transficeal screws do give you more of a cosmetic outcome. Okay, so let's talk about fetlocks now. Really the most important thing to remember about angular limb deformities with fetlock is this is where you have a very, very narrow window of opportunity. And you can do this in very, very young foals. In other words, weeks old if they're severely affected. Because if you think about it, it's not a linear drop off in growth of the growth plate. It is fairly reverse exponential. In other words, if you say that we need to do a fetlock by two months and you leave it until six weeks, then you're actually, you've only got two weeks left of fairly tailed off activity in that growth plate. Whereas if we do it earlier, we're going to have more scope for correction, if that makes sense. Okay, pox, this is a, this is a hawk with a transficeal screw. Putting these screws in has made doing hawks, at, at least in my hands, substantially easier because one of the problems with screws and wires is this bottom screw, you had a screw here and you had a screw here. And this one had to be really short and it was angled very steeply uphill. So I think the, the transficeal screws are, are a nicer way to do this. So let's just look at a case study. This is a this is a youngster that I saw recently. This is a three month old foal, and he had a bilateral carpal valgus from birth, which was responding to remedial farriery with medial extensions. 
but the referring vet felt that the right knee was not responding adequately. And this foal had actually been sent off to a sale and then was returned from the sale because of this. Okay, so here he is walking towards us. But also if you look at him, you can see that his fetlocks don't match either. Okay. And one of the things about showing you that video is that it's, it's sometimes extremely difficult to get a foal to just walk calmly towards you. They're usually leaping about and, and so you just have to take the time to, to just watch and watch until you've, until you've made your decision. So for this foal, yes, we have, a, we have a carpal valgus here. You can see how far out his toe points just here. Now the left fore looks more complicated. He does appear to have a carpal valgus in this knee here. But also if you look closely at the cannon bone and the radius here, we actually probably have more of what's called a bench knee, which is where the cannon bone and the radius are offset and the cannon bone is sets a bit more laterally. Also, we can say that this knee is not normal, but the toe is pointing forward. So that's a really useful trick. If you have a foal that has an has a a carpal valgus, their toe should point outwards. So if you have a foal that has a carpal valgus, but in the same limb the toe is pointing forwards, that foal also has a fetlock varus deformity. But of course this foal is three months old, so there's nothing we can do about that fetlock. So that we're just going to have to take on the chin. Okay, so we don't have any surgical options for this fetlock. Um, if we try to manipulate the left carpus, we run the risk that we're going to make that left front fetlock look even worse. And my feeling is that visually it's better to have a matched set that may not be completely perfect rather than one perfect looking joint and the contralateral one is still a little bit off. Okay, so what's our plan? Well, in discussion with all concerned, the plan was to place a transficeal screw in the right carpus, but also continue the remedial ferriery with a lateral extension on the left front fetlock for the fetlock varus in the hopes that there might be a small amount of residual growth in that fetlock. Okay, this is just a, um, just a little picture to, sh to show you about putting in a transficeal screw. Whoops, sorry. So here, because we need to get to the inside of the, inside of the leg, okay, so we're gonna have to position the fall carefully. There usually isn't this much blood involved, to be honest. The problem with, with the ones on the knees is that the cephalic vein is usually sitting exactly where you want it to be but it's done through stab incisions just here, okay? And then we're going to try to put in as long a screw as we can, because remember the foal is going to grow, but the screw is not going to grow. And if the foal grows so much that the screw is no longer passing through the growth plate, then it's probably not going to do a great deal, okay? And here's just a radiographic um, um, series of how to do this. So little marker staples just here, okay? And again, we want, to, we want to be going right across half of the growth plate just here. So on this one, I decided I'm not as far through as I can go. I can probably get a little bit further down. So I've got more screw in here. Let me just check where we are laterally. This is a depth gauge measuring how long a screw we need to put in. And then this is the screw. And then if you look here, it really looks like this is actually impinging into the joint. So we're gonna take a lateral or a flex lateral just here to reassure ourselves that, that we're not, that's just, it's just this concavity superimposed over the end of the screw. Okay, so this foal also was still going to have um, the extensions done for this fat lock just here. And again, if you have a good relationship with the remedial ferriery, that is definitely something that's worth celebrating. Okay, so what's the outcome for this little guy? Okay. You can see he's grown, okay. That left front fat lock looks a bit better, but that's probably partially because we're also looking at an extension. But the knee looks a bit better. Yeah, and I think we're I think we're doing all right just here. And you can see he has grown substantially. And that's that's another useful thing to remember is that you can actually wean a foal at 10 weeks of age and not have any detriment to his final, his or her final uh, final growth. And, and that's weaning a foal at two and a half months of age, which to all of us seems very, very young. But rapid growth is definitely associated with orthopedic, developmental orthopedic issues. So 
just bear that in mind if you have one that is that just seems to be growing very very rapidly okay when do we re when do we remove the screw okay well we need to remove the screw I tend to tell people that when they're happy they've got a match set or they're happy with the outcome we need to remove it within four days and touch wood I haven't had overcorrection after a transficial screw but it is a consideration and it has been reported okay let's now change tax and move into the sagittal plane and talk about flexural deformities okay. the first point is these are always and it's very still very entrenched in the literature these are called contracted tendons which is incorrect actually because tendons have essentially no ability to contract what we can contract is the musculotendinous unit so the muscle part that's attached to the tendon that muscle can definitely contract but the tendons themselves can't so flexural deformities are, are a better way to put it and they are defined by the joint that is involved so this is a fetlock flexural deformity in a hind limb and again this just raises the point that if you are looking at a foal and you're looking at distal limb conformation and you're looking at them out in a field or in a box you can miss quite a lot because you can't see the foot because of because of the um um, because of either the bedding or the grass. So it's really good to look at these on a firm surface. Okay, don't worry too much about this. Um, it's just really to raise the point that we can have both congenital flexural deformities and we can have acquired flexural deformities. The, the congenital ones is a huge long list, none of which have really been proven. They've often, it's often a single case report. But the acquired ones, and we'll discuss these in more depth, the, the only thing really I want you to take away from this image here is that these are, these are pain related issues. Okay, and that's quite important when we think about how they happen and how we treat them. So let's talk about the congenital ones. So these are congenital flexural deformities that the foal is born with. And these can cause a dystocia, but it's always surprised me what a mare can actually deliver in terms of a foal that does not have straight legs. Most commonly, this is going to be fetlocks and the carpus, but we can also get hocks, hind fetlocks, coffin joints, that's pretty unusual, pastern joints, that's very unusual as well, and might be a slightly different etiology in pastern joints. Okay, so it, the other thing is that pictures can be extremely misleading. Okay, if we look at this picture just here, I know because I've looked at this foal, I know that the knees are the problem here, and that if I push on the front of the knee, I can't get it to bend backwards. But just from a photograph, it doesn't look like the fetlock is normal either. And so it's very difficult, again, off a picture to, to say what's what. But they tend, it's very, 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 very unusual to get more than one flexural deformity in one leg. I want to mention digital hyperextension deformities. This is the, this is the reverse of a, our typical flexural deformities, but they are a, they are, they are a, condition which occurs in the sagittal plane and they are a developmental problem. So I just mentioned these. This is really where the musculotendinous unit is just not quite strong enough. And it's very common to see them in premature and dismature folds. This one in the middle was delivered by cesarean section just here. And the real problem with these is that whole skin is so delicate and is like tissue paper that if they're, if particularly the, the deep digital flexor musculotendinous unit um, and the superficial to, to a degree as well. But if they are so slack that the foal's toes are coming up, what's going to happen is that the skin is going to hit the ground surface and this skin will wear away very, very quickly. So in terms of treating these, generally the mild ones are self-correcting and they just need to have their exercise restricted for a bit. If we have ones where the skin is contacting the ground, they need some sort of dressing over them, but again, along the same lines of why we don't put a full limb cast on these foals. If we, put, if we put so much support from a bandage, it's actually not going to encourage that muscular tendinous unit to strengthen up and it's just going to perpetuate them becoming soft. We can also put extensions on. These are just some little aluminum plates just here. When that happens, I tend to then pack out the extension, the heel extension, and then tape it on with some e-band or elastoplast. I, this foal looks like he's wearing espadrilles and he's off to the beach, but 
The problem is they can, they or the mare can step on the loose ends, and also if you've got a sharp bit of metal, it can be, it can be a little bit traumatic for the mare or the foal. Okay. So again, remember this is for flexural deformities. We're talking about farriery on the toe or the heel. These are some, these are some that have just come off a foal. You can see that they're a little bit used there, but, but. Again, the principle is the same. We have a little cuff and then we have a little heel extension just there. And you can put a, a degree of a wedge in if you want to. This was, a, um, this was a, an interesting case. This is a miniature Shetland that had it. And there aren't any proprietary farriery that is, is big enough to do that. So what I did in this foal is I made them out of tongue depressors and white tape. And you can see them sitting just here. Which raises another interesting point. If you deal with any of these miniatures, these chondrodysplastic dwarves, and you see one that looks like this, this is, this is Shetlands, miniature Shetlands and miniature horses. It has been actually described in an, in an Arab yearling, but generally it's the very small ones. And what this is, is actually, it is a flexural deformity because the limb is held in an abnormally flexed position. But this is a congenital patellar luxation. And this is very much like small breed dogs where the trochlear groove in the stifle is not deep enough when it forms. And so the patella luxates. And so this foal actually was coming in to have surgery to sort out this, but you can see the toes are pointing up. So hence the tongue depressors and very blue Peter, but it's very effective. Okay, let's talk about fetlocks now. Okay, and again, this is the same this, you can't tell if it's knees or fetlocks from this picture just here. Okay, this is a, this is a severely affected foal, okay? And the poor little guy, look at him, you know, he's really struggling and you can imagine how cramped the muscles are down his back, poor thing. And he just, he doesn't really know whether he's coming or going just here. You see, he's sort of flummoxed that his, you know, his feet aren't working entirely properly. And one of the reasons to show you this is obviously this is severely affected, but this foal did absolutely fine. So it's always really nice to know sometimes that things that just look like a disaster from the outset can be fine. If we want to, if we're thinking about the carpal region here, sorry, this picture has been cut off at the knees proverbially. Um, again, these are foals that have a varying degree of an inability to straighten their leg. And it is thought that if you can physically manipulate the knee into a more normal position, those folds do better. And I think that's probably fair to say. Sorry, another sideways fold. Okay. So this fold, this is as good as it's as good as he could do. Okay, that's as much as he could. And so even fully weight bearing when the other front leg is off the ground, he can't straighten out his legs just there. Okay. Um, this was a, this was a foal, you can see he's a big beefy foal, and this is a foal that I had been saying that really we needed to do something with this, and the stud owner said, no, they all get better. I've never had one that didn't just get better, and so it was one of these, uh, feel like you're missing, missing the window of opportunity, and um, we all have clients like this where they're very strong characters, and I was told in no uncertain terms that the foal was going to get dropped off at the hospital on Tuesday morning, I could have it until Friday afternoon, and I needed to sort it out in those four days. So that's um, probably slightly a big ask, but if you can get them going in the right direction, that certainly helps. But you see, see how sturdy this hole is, you know, and the other thing I said is you really, really need to wean this hole, which people are very resistant about doing, no question about it. Okay, we'll come back to that hole a little bit later. I want to mention the ruptured common digital extensor tendon. This is a this is a condition that once you've seen one of them, they're very very easy to spot, and they look like a flexural deformity because the folds tend to buckle over at the knee and at the fetlock. And what you get is you get this tubular, soft and squishy, vertically oriented swelling on the distal lateral aspect of the radius, okay? So this is, this is where the tendon has ruptured within the tendon sheath, and it's the tendon sheath that you're feeling. And often you'll see them in conjunction with, in folds that also have carpal flexural deformities, possibly because they're, they're trying so hard to straighten their legs. But once you, these look odd because the folds, when they're walking around, they basically knuckle forwards. And so, 
the, the treatment for these is actually to box rest these poles, but in, you don't do anything to the knee, but what you do is you, you put a, a bandage on the fetlock, and if they can fix their fetlock, then in other words, it can stay fixed in position and they can wait there, then they can, they can ambulate fairly normally. Um, these take a variable length of time to sort out, but usually they need to stay in the box for a few weeks. The cosmetic outcome remarkably is good. As these go on, you can actually palpate the tendon sheath and feel the torn ends of the tendon as they cover with granulation tissue. Just really resist the temptation to stick a needle in and drain these because the, the difference between an effusion and a septic tendon sheath is just a needle away. Okay, so we've said that for flexural deformities, we almost never need to radiograph them because we're dealing with soft tissue injuries here. Um, but I'll show you a couple examples of, um, of odd, just odd cases that did require radiography. So let's talk about fetlock flexural deformities particularly. Okay, and we're talking about congenital fetlock flexural deformities in terms of non-surgical management for these folds. Okay, regardless of the, whether we're talking about and any type, whichever type of flexural deformity we're talking about, the exercise bit is a little bit of a double-edged sword because you need enough exercise that you're actually putting a little bit of strain on that muscular tenderness unit to try and loosen things up, like going for a stretch before you go for a run. But what we don't want is so much exercise that the fold becomes overtired because then we get a rebound contracture of that muscular tenderness unit, and then we're actually no further ahead. In fact, we're probably further behind. So if you have a foal that, again, you are treating for something like this, and it seems to be going backwards, the very first thing that I would think about is just that it's having too much exercise. Analgesics are extremely important, and particularly when we talk about acquired flexural deformities, again, because the condition itself is probably, is probably painful, but certainly the treatments that we do for these foals are painful as well. And putting splints on foals and pulling their leg into a a position that it's not comfortable doing is going to be is going to be painful for these folds. And if if you were with us last week, that um, sheet of analgesic doses split up by age group is quite useful. Oxytetracycline is a um, this is this is very interesting. We've sort of moved forward on a little bit on how this works. So tetracycline initially the thought was that it chelates calcium. I think if that were the case, you'd end up with a foal that just couldn't get up off the floor because everything would be lax. It actually has, um, there have been a, a few papers lately that have shown that actually what this does is it, it, um, it uh, on a cellular level, it actually ups the cross-linking collagen and it causes a it causes a temporary degree of laxity in these muscular tendinous units. What's a, what else is interesting is that it appears to only work in fetlock joints, doesn't work in coffin joints, and there's no evidence to say that it works in knees as of yet. So it's very appropriate for fetlocks. You wouldn't be wrong to use it for knees or coffin joints, but just it's it's generally not going to work in these joints. In terms of farriery, again, our toe extensions, and we can do some splinting and some casting. And this little picture in the corner, I'll give you a little bit more detail on how to do those, because these are splints that actually are very easy to make in the field or in a clinic and don't require anything particularly fancy or expensive. Okay. Um, this is, this is, a, this is a, a homemade splint. Um, the original material that I used to make these was made by Smith and Nephew, and it, it's not available anymore. But but you can you can very easily easily do this with casting material and some gamji that you have. And the whole idea here is that you're making a splint. You're making a splint based on the unaffected leg. You can do it if you have a bilaterally affected fold, but it's a little bit easier if it's unilaterally affected. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a splint based on the good leg, and then we're gonna put that splint on the bad leg. So you can see now, this is the front of the fetlock, and this is the back of the splint. So the fetlock should actually be sitting here. And what this does is a couple of things. Because these are custom made to that foal, they fit only that foal, and you can use them for a couple weeks at a time. It also shows you 
every day that you change it, you should be able to pull that, um, that fetlock further back into that splint. And these are, these are literally just made with um, sheets of four inch casting material and some gamgee. I was making some recently and didn't have enough casting material and actually used hexalite, which is the stuff you use to put on the bottom of a cast so that it's abrasion resistant. And that worked quite well as well. So you can improvise a little bit in terms of, um, in terms of um, the materials you use. And with any fetlock flexural deformity, really what we, what the aim of the game is that we get the fetlock so that it is positioned behind the foot, because once it's positioned behind the foot, that is actually going to then put pull on that flexor musculotendinous apparatus. But as this foal's fetlock is at the moment, the only thing that's under strain is going to be the extensor tendons. And I'll show you some more pictures to explain that. Okay, so here's how we do these. Okay, so this is our flexural deformity. This is the splint that I've made off of the good leg just here. And then I'm going to attach this to this. Now, these, these pictures show how to make the splint, but what I would say is, particularly if you're doing this with an owner, do not use vet wrap, just use an elasticated, something like E-band or Elastoplast, because if this vet wrap gets wet, it's gonna make a tourniquet and you're going to have a problem. So just do remember that, that this is, this vet wrap is not appropriate really for these in clinical cases. Okay, we seldom need to resort to surgical management seldom, seldom need to, which is good, but generally it's going to be very severe cases or those that don't respond to medical management. And I won't go into the, to the various conditions um, because it's very unusual that you need to even resort to that. So the good thing is, and a, a take home point is that there's a very good expectation that you can sort these out. Um, you can sort these out either with the owner or in a clinic situation. Okay, so let's look at knees now. So now we have carpal flexural deformities, congenital flexural deformities. And I've shown you this picture of the fold that we've just made some sleeve cast for, and then one that is, is up and about just here. So this is a slightly, there are pros and cons to splints and there are pros and cons to sleeve casts. The pros and cons to splints are that you can take them on and off very easily, see how you're doing. I tend to, as a splinting protocol, have them on for 12 hours and then off for 12 hours. The downside to splints is that they do tend to shift out of position. If you make these custom ones that I was showing you some images of, they slide around an awful lot less, but as the folds get bigger, that casting material construct just isn't strong enough to actually, um, they, they'll, they'll, the folds will just break the splints. The plus side to sleeve cast is that they're a lot stronger, but if they start to go wrong, then they tend to go wrong very quickly. And so my feeling is that sleeve cast are, they're probably preferable for knees, but I would only do it in a clinic situation. I wouldn't leave these at home with an owner. Okay, so if you remember now, this is the foal that I showed you walking around who couldn't straighten out his legs that I was given a few days to deal with. Um, in that four days, he probably made more than a 50% improvement, but he certainly wasn't normal by the time he, he was discharged um, or just collected. But this is that same foal now, probably a couple months later. So we actually made a good start on straightening out his knees. This is his knees when he was little. And, and so don't be put off just trying because it's, it's this, I quite like this case because it looked so bad to begin with and it did absolutely fine with what is, could probably be best described as a suboptimal treatment regime. Okay. So again, these chondrodysplastic dwarves, they're very, very cute, but they are, they're a different kettle of fish. They often have angular limb deformities. This, this has a bit of everything, but in terms of angular limb deformities, they often have complete ulnas and fibulas, which causes part of the problem, okay? Um, surgical management, again, if you remember one thing about surgery and flexural deformities, it's is that unless you're talking about coffin joints, if you're thinking about surgery, you're really into a salvage proposition. And so then you need to ask yourself whether that is actually the right thing to do for that foal. But in terms of the carpus, there are things that we can do. In a very simplistic sense, it's basically cutting everything that's tight across the back of the knee. Okay, so that's congenital flexural deformities. And again, that's going, that's going to be, those are the ones that are present at birth and you're most 
frequently going to be dealing with fetlocks and knees. Now let's move on to acquired flexural deformities. Okay, and if, again, these are part of the, I consider them part of the developmental orthopedic disease complex because they are a condition of developing horses and they are orthopedic. But again, think back to that diagram that says that these probably come from a painful focus or a, a painful condition. And the two main theories that have been put forward over the year was one was a mismatch in bone and tendon ligament growth. So in other words, the, the bones were growing faster than the muscular tendinous unit. Uh, there, are a couple, there are a number of reasons why this really probably isn't actually the case. What's, what I think is the issue is a contraction of the muscular tendinous unit in response to pain. And one of the reasons that, and we've probably all seen this, one of the reasons that I think that the mismatch is, is, um, can't be the reason is that there are acquired flexural deformities that literally appear from one day to the next literally in 24 or 48 hours. And there just really isn't any way that you can have that substantial amount of bone growth over that time period. So again, remember back to this. And so now we're looking at acquired flexural deformities. Okay, so let's just look at this a little bit more. Nutrition, okay, so these are the foals that are, that are growing very, very quickly or foals that have very abrupt changes from both the quality and the quantity of what they're actually being fed, okay? This is going to make them grow very quickly. And this is going to predispose them to things like OCD, bisitis, angular limb deformities, okay? So that is again where nutrition and, and weaning is very important. Uh, mineral imbalance has been implicated. Let's say for argument's sake, we have a foal that had an infected joint when they were, when they were a youngster and we've got pain. We can then end up with a, a situation where either we, the foal can't bear weight on the affected leg or it overloads the other leg. And a very good description, I think, of folds from an orthopedic point of view is that folds are like plastic. You can actually change the shape of a foal's skeleton. And it can either happen through a disease process or it can happen because we, um, because of the way that we have decided to treat these conditions. It's not at all uncommon for lameness in the affected leg to precede the development of an acquired flexural deformity. A lot of times this just passes unnoticed, but if you, if you have an astute owner or a foal that you've been watching for a while. So it's not at all uncommon, and it was actually written up as a case report probably the better part of 20 years ago, but a, a season in Newmarket where it was extremely dry and they were having a bumper crop of foals with coffin joint flexural deformities. And again, this is, was thought to be, and I think it's completely correct, and we certainly still see it, is concussion on the hard ground and their feet get sore and they end up with a cough and joint flexural deformity. So if we have a painful process, we can end up with muscle contractions and then we can end up leading to the development of flexural deformities. And here's a little foal that has a cough and joint flexural deformity just here, which is one of the more common ones you're going to see. Now, one of the reasons that we cannot sit and watch what happens with flexural deformities is that, is that over time, they will actually get stuck in that position and we won't be able to manipulate them in any way because you, they will end up with a, a, a degree of not only periarticular contracture, but fibrosis around the joint. And that's not something that we can actually manipulate. Um, this is a case, this is actually quite a sad case. Um, this is a case that an Italian colleague sent to me. And this was a foal that had had septic arthritis and a fetlock. So if you want to see what a naturally occurring ankylosis looks like, it looks like this. Um, this foal had had um, septic arthritis, which was treated and apparently was treated successfully. But then this is the fetlock. And because the foal, because the fetlock is effectively an, a, a flexural deformity, over time what's happened is that this foal has actually luxated the coffin joint. And then as an add-on, in the other front leg, the foal got a, an acquired carpal varus deformity, so not a valgus, a, a varus deformity. And you can see actually this side of the radiocarpal joint is actually open. Okay, and you can see just how damaged the growth rate is here. And sorry for the sorry for the noise.
So unfortunately, by the time you get to that scenario, but what that, what that case does, I think, show nicely is that this is this whole idea that foals are like plastic. And what will often happen in foals that that case also shows is that if they have a, if they have a prolonged period of lameness or non-weight bearing in, for argument's sake, their left front leg, they are predisposed to get an angular limb deformity in the right front leg. That's different from adult horses who have, if they have a protracted period, say, of a severe left forelimb lameness, what they're in line to get is a left fore flexural deformity. So it's slightly different between foals and adults. Our acquired flexural deformities tend to fall into distinct age groupings. So the first ones that we're going to see are going to be our coffin joint flexural deformities, which generally crop up between about one and four months of age. Um, fetlocks usually same same age group, but um, go on a little bit longer. And and actually, I could quibble with my diagram just here because actually the both front and back fetlocks, these are the to, to me are the most difficult ones to deal with when you get it in a yearling. So when they're 10 to 18 months old, those are very very difficult to deal with. But let's talk about the coffin joints because these you're going to see most frequently. Okay, it's mostly going to be the forelimbs. And this is the this involves the muscular tendinous unit of the deep digital flexor tendon. So remember that the deep digital flexor tendon inserts on the solar surface of P3. And so if that, if you have an effective shortening of that muscular tendinous unit, what it's going to do is it's going to try to draw, rotate the pedal bone backwards. And they get divided into stage ones and stage twos. I th don't think that it matters enormously. Stage one is they haven't passed the vertical. Stage two is they've gone past vertical just here. But a couple of things that these pictures show here is that it reminds me a little bit of taking the top off of a sardine can. You can see how in all of these holes here that the hoof wall at the toe has become split and fragmented. And there, there's so much load and uh, it's basically getting pried off of off of the, so it's going to be very painful on the laminae. They're going to get secondary infection up the white line just here. But also if we're saying that these are a, these are a painful condition to begin with, this is actually only going to make matters worse. Fetlocks, again, these I, these I find the most difficult to deal with because these horses, these are yearlings, these are big horses. So this is a, um, sorry for the glare, this is a horse in training um, in a different country actually. And you can see the farrier has put an enormous toe extension on and it's still not going to do it. But this, this is a, um, this is a, a, a good, this picture is a, I think is a good example of how you're not going to get a jump on these until you can get the fetlock actually behind the foot. This is a mildly affected horse. This horse actually did fine. But if you think about it, if the fetlock is in front of the foot, then it's going to be the extensor tendons under the strain, under strain. And if we say that we need to actually put some strain on the affected muscular tendinous unit until that, sorry, until that fetlock is behind the foot, we're not going to. It's all just going to be onto the extensor tendons. Okay. Um, this is an example again of the. This is a this is a little weanling that um, his friends ran him through a fence and had some horrible wounds here, but debriding them under GA wasn't an option because it, radiographs showed that he also had a radial fracture. So we were dealing with this, um, uh, dealing with this medically and not surgically. And this is an example that this youngster is now at risk of getting an angular limb deformity in the other front leg just here. If you were an adult horse, it would be to get a flexural deformity in this one just here. The fetlock region is complicated because it can involve either the deep and or the superficial and less frequently the suspensory. And if you read the books, they all just say, oh, well, palpate the leg and see which one is the tightest. I don't think it's actually quite that easy to do. Okay. So I've said that radiography, we don't need, we need almost never, okay. But if you've got one that just looks really weird or it's just not getting better, this is a photograph. Um, this is a photograph of Jorg Hours. It was in the, the original flexural deformity chapter in the um, Hours equine surgery. And you can see that actually this, if you look at it physically, this, this hole is going to have a very crescent shaped or banana shaped hawk. 
but this is not a good underlying reason why. But it's always nice to see things that look like they shouldn't do well and that do fine. These are radiographs that a friend of mine sent me. This is at the foal when it was little. So to look at, the foal had an abnormal um, appearance, an abnormal physical appearance. And so she radiographed it and got this, which does not look good because the, if, you, if you think about it, the proximal intertarsal, distal intertarsal, tarsal intertarsal joint, they should be roughly horizontal. You can see they're sloping quite a ways downhill, and I think that's because of this angulation in the top of the cannon bone just here. But fortunately, this foal had um, had a good whoops, had a good vet, and also had a had an owner who was willing to just give it some time. And it's amazing what can sort itself out because there was really no treatment for this foal other than <clears throat> other than time. And this is the foal as a yearling about to go into training. So again. Never say never and never say always. Again, we don't want to look at these youngsters in the grass because you're going to miss it, okay? These are often, if you compare front and back, this looks okay. Here, the foal is standing on their toe, okay? These are often called ballerina foals by the farriers. And what happens here is, as two things happen. As they go up on their toe, they, the, the strain on the dorsal hoof wall is really pretty immense and the dorsal hoof wall is effectively getting pried off of the pedal bone. But the other thing is when they're very upright is that the, their heels don't touch the ground and then they start to overgrow and that's where you get these boxy or club feet which they're also, um, which is another term that's used for them. Common treatment principles for acquired flexural deformities across the board. Nutrition, again we want to stop them from if they seem to be growing excessively, we want to work on that. The physiotherapy and exercise, that's just as we discussed for the congenital flexural deformities where a enough is great, too much is detrimental for the foals. So again, if you have one that it looks worse after exercise, then consider that it's doing too much exercise. Analgesics, I can't really say quite enough about this. I think it's really inappropriate to try to treat these without analgesics because they've most reasonably occurred because of pain. And then what we're going to try to do to sort it out is also going to be uncomfortable for these falls. So that's very, very important. And again, I've said that the that surgery for flexural deformities is largely salvage other than coffin joints. And that one actually does carry quite a good Okay. So again, just a few more pictures just to show you this is a very overgrown heel because it didn't have anything to wear it down. Okay. This is a foal that's just gone up on the toe. And here's a foal with a, an acrylic toe extension on just here. Now, there are two trains of thought in terms of, in terms of extensions. Um, I tend to use ex toe extensions as a first line for coffin joint flexural deformities but they need to be put on very carefully. They can't sit just at the toe. They actually have to extend quite a way around medially and laterally because otherwise all you're doing is creating more of a lever arm and creating more tearing of the lamina just here. So that's quite important. But, but there is a train of thought that toe extensions are actually not the right thing to do because they're just going to make the fall more painful. And so there, there is a subset of clinicians who would advocate uh, a heel, heel elevation to try to decrease the pain. I think the short answer is they're foals that respond to both methods of treatment, but in general, I would always try a toe extension first, and I can't remember, I can't remember the last one where I had to actually do heel elevation, but it's a very individual thing. Um, cast application is, is almost never used. You might find it reported in the literature, but again, we have the problem with encasing the entirety of a foal's foot, but that also it's very difficult to get, a, to get the coffin joint into a normal position and put a cast on at the same time. So it's just something that, that tends not to get used. This is a lovely, um, I think this is a lovely set of pictures that a, a farrier sent me. So this is how the foal started. And again, you've seen this one before and it's all split and it's overgrown and you can see how it's, it's sort of splaying out and sort of turning up on itself, okay? And a lot of bruising up here as well, okay? So the first thing he did was trimmed all this because what you don't want to do is put an extension over an infected bit of foot. That's not gonna help at all. So he's trimmed it up very nicely and taken that back, but it's still not getting its heel to the ground. 
And then he puts a toe extension on, and now the foal's heel is on the ground. And you can see this covers quite a lot of the surface of the foot so that we're distributing, well, he is distributing the load away from just a pressure point at the toe. Um, and again, the only surgery really that has a very good outlook for flexural deformities is a desmotomy of the accessory ligament of the deep digital flexor tendon or an inferior or a distal check ligament desmotomy. And really all this procedure is aimed at doing is you can see where the surgery, this is the, you can see little staples just here. What the surgery is doing is if you take out the check ligament, which, which constrains the degree that, to which the deep digital flexor muscular tendinous apparatus can extend overall, it gives you that extra little bit there. And so at the end of these surgeries, when you've cut it, what you should see is that actually it springs apart Okay, so you know you've already gained at least a centimeter just there. And that is, um, that is done in conjunction, almost always in conjunction with trimming and balancing the foot and putting a toe extension on. And generally, the sooner you do this, the better. So in foals that it was done before they were a year of age, they tended to do better than foals where it was left until they were an adult. And remember in flexural deformities, the, there, with any sort of chronicity, you do end up with the issue of periarticular contracture, and then you just can't get, you can't get on top of those. Okay. Um, Fetlock region, again, I find these just so difficult. And this is an ancient picture, I just, but I just, I love the thinking behind this. So what they've done here, um, this is, a, that is another picture of Jorg Auer's, um, is they've made a shoe and they put these bars in the shoe, okay? And then they've taken a car inner tube and, and put it around these two bars on the inside and the outside to push the fetlock backwards. And I just think that's such a clever bit of engineering thinking just there because this is very strong, very, very strong. And that's one of the problems with treating these is that we don't, in these big horses, we don't have constructs really that are strong enough to do it. But also it's, it's a very strong material that's going to be putting a uniform amount of pressure there. But again, again, remember that if you look at this picture here, the only thing under strain in this leg are the extensor tendons. And until we can get that fetlock behind the foot, it doesn't matter how big a toe extension they have on, we're not going to get on top of it. Now, the, um, the reason I put oxytetracycline with lots of question marks is that there's nothing written down about using tetracycline in these older horses. But I've had a case and I've had colleagues that have had cases where you're getting a bit desperate and some of these respond, they are very, very high doses of tetracycline. And so you do risk obviously giving them colitis, but it is something that, and this is just a very anecdotal mention. I've never seen it written down anywhere. I've just talked to a couple people that have tried it and I tried it once. So if you're, if you're tearing your hair out over one of these and it's either call it a day or run the risk of giving it diarrhea from tetracyclines, then that might be a, a, an option for you. So for both the coffin joint and the fetlock, um, toe extensions work. They're not gonna do much for anything further up the leg than that, okay? And again, they're supposed to work because of this reverse myotactic response, which basically means that you it's, it, again, it's like stretching out your tight calf muscles before you go for a run. You're just trying to elongate them ever so slightly. This is an interesting case, actually. This is an adult horse. He was in his 20s. And this is out with talking about foals, but this is a horse that had, a, um, had an ongoing check ligament desmitis that resulted in a flexural deformity. So um, he had he had surgery and he had a toe extension, but it's just a nice barriery picture, picture to show you. I'm not really going to dwell on surgical management because again, this is, this is salvage basically, but this diagram just to, just to, just to show a couple of things. One is that when we're, one is that when we're talking about the fetlock, we have a, we are talking about the deep, the superficial, and occasionally the suspensory. Okay. And then the, the other one is just in green. This is this little offshoot is your check ligament just here. So if you section that, the whole idea is that this green musculotendinous unit 
is going to be a little bit longer than it was. So in summary for flexural deformities, these are ones, identify them quickly, treat them quickly, monitor these folds for growing too quickly, and that will help avoid flexural deformities. But once one has occurred, spot it early and then treat it as quickly as you can, and then you'll get the best outcome. Um, just a, a note of thanks to uh, the Chapel Forge Farriers in Lambourne. Um, I do realize that it is a real luxury to have good remedial farriers, farriers to work with. So a lot of these cases I did in conjunction with Gary Pickford. Thank you very much.